Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Not Content Podcast. On this podcast, we pull from the seemingly endless queue of movies, television shows, and maybe even other surprises along the way as part of our podcast channel from the queue. On this episode, we are going to discuss The Last Boy Scouts. He's a private detective who's run out of luck. He's an ex-quarterback who was thrown from the gate. They were trying to clean up their act when they got dragged into the dirty world of gridiron corruption. Now they've got one shot to get the goods on the bad guys if they don't kill each other first. What am I going to do? Point at the bad guys and shoot! Bruce Willis, Damon Wayans, The Last Boy Scout. Rated R. Starts Friday, December 13th at a theater near you. Please subscribe, like, and review from the queue on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform, especially Spotify and Apple, as you can get those algorithms going with positive feedback. You can find our channel on Blue Sky at From the Queue. You can also find this through on, find us through Instagram at From the Queue and Threads. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, all links will be in the description below. My name is Jerome Cuson. You can find me on Instagram at Jerome Cuson, and you can find me on Blue Sky at jerome c 1985 my co-host is brian you can find him on twitter for now at brian to brain brian uh a couple uh this this episode is a, a couple days late we do apologize for that uh this is my fault uh there's some home stuff going on i'm putting a you know my tv up i have a brand new tv to watch all of the movies and shows we'll be discussing here on the podcast um but it was uh touch and go in terms of availability uh, so that is why we are a couple of days late. We are also a couple of days late because uh, one of us, i.e. me, forgot that there were five Tuesdays in January. So we forgot to plan. So the, consider this. Uh, this is like the the free for all version. Uh, we are counting down to our theme for February. Our theme for February, since it is, of course, the month of the Super Bowl, we are going to be discussing all football all the time. We are going to kind of do a little bit of a preview. This is not a very football-heavy movie, but we will be discussing The Last Boy Scout. Uh, this is kind of a last-minute suggestion by Brian. And Brian, I know that this is a movie that you were looking forward to watching. This was a rewatch for me. Uh, what did you think? Uh, we got Tony Scott. We got Bruce Willis. What do we got? Well, it's interesting because I actually watched this a couple of years ago, but I watched it on like on my laptop on shitty quality. So for this episode, I wanted to watch it in HD. I ordered it on Amazon Prime. It looks really great. Uh, it's just really interesting that like we can't seem to escape Shane Black on this podcast. I don't throughout the years he just comes up in like different <laughs> like it's either a movie or a script of his or something, or we offhand talk about Predator all the time. But uh, this movie came out in December, Jerome, and yet it doesn't involve christmas so this is weird we're talking about a shane black movie that came out in december does not involve christmas but involves football and uh it's got a hell of a soundtrack i'll admit that but i gotta i gotta say this script by shane black is one of the worst scripts he's ever written but uh i say this tony scott directed the hell out of it so there's that balance you know what i'm saying you say that but one of the things that i want to point out is that there have been heavy changes to the script so we don't know what version was shot? We don't know. Maybe this was a not so good second draft, perhaps. Maybe the version that we are seeing is a little bit compromised uh, because, of course, Bruce Willis and Tony Scott have a lot of power and a lot of influence at this point. So I don't know if we are getting a pure distillation of Shane Black's vision here. See, that's the thing is like. You would think Shane Black would know the ins and outs of like I think he's a I think would assume he's a football fan, right? But for some reason the script is written where like the owner of the LA football franchise is like a murdering son of a bitch. Like, what? Like what are we doing here? And then he's trying to kill the senator? It's like what are we doing here? <laughs> like it's ridiculous. But the main draw is like the the back and forth and the buddy comedy 
stuff going on with, you know, Bruce Willis and Damon Wayans. So that's that's kind of the draw. Like if I were to watch this in 1992 and I rented it on, you know, on VHS or whatever, and it was just one of those nights on a Saturday night, I think I would have got my three dollars worth. So in terms of that, it's it's fine. And I can see why this has grown a cult following over the years, because, hey, Tony Scott's always got a cult following for every one of his movies. B, it's very well shot, except for the sports stuff, which we'll get into. But I think C also is that, you know, it's Bruce Willis, early 90s, it's that charm, you know, it's, you know, that diehard charm that everyone's trying to milk that cow out of. And uh, it kind of works here, sort of, but it goes to the point where he's just too much of, like, an asshole. So it's very hard to like this guy, this version of Bruce Willis in Last Boy Scout. But uh, I say Damon Wayans did a good job, even though, I don't know, he... I felt like that character could have taken some some darker turns and some darker like, you know, introspection or whatever. Because that that I think in today's world we would have gone more into the sports dark side of sports kind of background of him. But other than that, like you know, they kind of touched it on the surface, and I get it. But uh, I think a better script could have been taken out of this and just minus the whole like let's get the L.A. sports owner. Uh, make him a killer and want to kill the senator for want to, wanting to legalize sports betting in California, which is ridiculous. But, you know, that's kind of where this is. That's why I'm kind of like, Shane Black, dude, what did you do on this script? But, hey, maybe it's not all him. Maybe it was just, like, cut to pieces, but yeah, it just doesn't it's, seem like it. It very much feels like that. Uh, so Tony Scott hated working with Joel Silver so much on this movie that this is why we have the character of Lee Donowitz in True Romance, another movie that I feel like Brian and I need to talk about at some point. Uh, because it's one of my favorite Tony Scott movies. It, it's a great marriage of a Tarantino script and uh, Tony Scott's directorial uh, vision. This is the final collaboration between legendary action producer Joel Silver and actor Bruce Willis. Apparently they did not get along after uh, Die Hard, Hudson Hawk, as well as this movie. Uh, Joel Silver said this movie was a terrible experience. Tony Scott also was miserable uh, Bruce Silver, Bruce Willis were taking things over, altering the script. So it's uh, it's pretty sad just to think. Uh, Danielle Harris, who plays Bruce Willis's daughter, uh, said in a 2018 interview uh, that this is still one of her favorite roles. Uh, Brian, did you look at her IMDb? Oh, I know she's like Halloween four and five star. Like I, she's part of my childhood. Like I watched the shit out of four and five Halloween, even though I. Looking back now, Halloween 4 and 5 are uh, not so great, especially 5. But, like, she is, like, an iconic scream queen that came out. It feels like she came out of nowhere, but, like, the 90s and the late 2000s, early, early 2000s, when rentals on those old-school Halloween movies were, like, popping, it, like, she made, like, she became this cult star. So I love her, man. Like, I love her in the Halloween movies, and I'm sure I'm not even thinking of the other stuff. In fact, she was also in the Halloween remake in 2007. So, yeah, I love Daniela Harris, man. And I think she was the best actor in this movie. And, uh, again, I'll go on my, my soapbox and say that child actors should be held accountable for being good. Uh, case in point, the little girl from Godzilla Minus One. Case in point, Daniel Harris here in Last Boy Scout. Uh, she's just an excellent actress, man. And at, what, 14 years old when she made this? Like, she was stealing the show from Bruce Willis on screen. So, like, what does that tell you? I'm not sure. I mean, I think that... I. The initial scene with Bruce Willis kind of frustrated me because it just felt like it was just going on and on and on and not really going anywhere. But then she kind of becomes like the third wheel, and I think the movie gets a lot better. I think, and we'll get into this later, this movie feels in so many ways like it's spare parts from another number of other Shane Black movies, including like Lethal Weapon, The Nice Guys. It just feels like it's elements of other movies, and this one just doesn't work nearly as well. Uh, Shay Black was at one time one of the hottest screenwriters in Hollywood after his work on Predator, after his work on Lethal Weapon. Uh, he sold this script for $1.75 million. And uh, so Shane Black was uh, was really hot at this time. So one thing that Shane Black said, and he and Tony Scott both agree on this, is that they say the original script is far better uh, than the final film. And I don't know. I mean, I think when you watch other Shane Black movies from this time, I tend to believe this. And I just, I wish, I would love to see a, a less compromised version of this. Like, in some ways, I, I bemoan the idea of remakes, but this is the kind of movie that I think you should remake. 
Um, I think you could change some of the gambling elements a little bit, but this is the kind of movie that's very flawed, but that you could probably do a better job with now. Honestly, I thought Michael B. Jordan should be in that Damon Wayans role. Like I saw, I was when I was watching it, I was like, man, this is this is something that Michael B. Jordan can sink his teeth into, give it some nuance, you know, and then like throw in those comedy lines too, but also like get it over. But I just thought, like, I don't know, like Damon Wayans is not like a dramatic actor in my eyes, and he was trying, and I really appreciate his effort. Here's, in terms of, here's like, a casting for you, Brian, because to me, Bruce Willis, the character is written older. And I'm saying this partially, the person that I'm going to say is partially because they were in a Shane Black movie, Russell Crowe and Michael B. Jordan in the remake from Boy Scout. Oh, yeah, that makes total sense, dude. That's that's it. That is so it. And, like, they just got to rid of, got to get rid of the part where this four soldiers try to kill the senator, and I'm cool with it. But, like, that's where I think that, like, Michael B. Jordan would be so good at this because there's these scenes where, like, it goes really dark, but, like... Damon Williams can't get to that darkness, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of dark elements about this, about, like, drugs and injuries and prescription painkillers and some some of the more dark, fascinating stuff that we've come to, like, that's come to light in the more recent years of, like, sports and, like, sports injuries and all that kind of thing. So there's a little, there's more to this story that they kind of dived into and dived into that character, but they kind of put the focus on Bruce Willis's character. This, this so honestly feels, to me, this feels like, Damon Wayans is like trying to expand, not just be a comedy guy. And it, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Like, I feel like, and it's funny because we're actually going to talk about Jimmy Fox and he is kind of in a similar boat, kind of going from comedy to playing this football player. And I think that works out so much better, but I think it's just, it's a character thing. It's the fact that Jamie Fox, like the problem with this movie is that Damon Wayans is like the co-lead. And that's part of the reason that it doesn't work. I think if Damon Wayans was kind of in a supporting role, I think it would be a little bit better. But, I mean, he's on the screen with Bruce Willis for like 80% of the movie, and that's part of why it doesn't work. Yeah, I just think the focus should have been more on on Damon Wayans' character. That's what it seems like the story was about anyway. And, like, Bruce Willis' character was just thrown in there. And then they kind of made it seem about him with, like, his wife and his partner and stuff. But it's really about... Like, you know, Damon Wayans' character is, like, this ex-quarterback who was, like, I don't know if he really, like, I don't know if they, they implied it well enough, but it seems like he was gambling, but they caught him, and he was, like, it seems like everyone was gambling, and he just be, happened to be the one that got caught, like a Pete Rose kind of situation. So, it's very interesting. Like, I love that aspect of the movie, but um, just this idea that we got to focus on Bruce Willis' family and get to know his wife and all that stuff, it was... I, I was like, I get it. They're trying to make you sympathize more with Bruce Willis, even though he's this asshole. And, like, his wife cheats on him, and even though he's, like, still kind of mean to her, and it feels like he's the victim, but, like, he's really still an asshole. So it's really hard to like him, but it's, like, there's more likability, for sure, with the Damon Wayans character. And um, just, I, I love that that monologue, or that, I guess, yeah, it was a monologue he had about his kid that died and his wife, and I kept thinking, like, man, if you would have shot this in, like, today... You would actually see that scene at the beginning of the movie and just like then you really like tug your heartstrings and start feeling for this character because I wasn't really feeling so bad for him because we never got to see any of his family or what he's talking about. It's just kind of like this passing thing. He's not even crying about it. He's just like so into the drugs. But I guess that's kind of the point of what they were going for. Like the drugs are just kind of covering the pain. And I get that the pain of losing his son and wife. But I think that's a much more fascinating story than this other shit going on. So that's kind of where I'm at on it. I don't disagree with you on on those points. I think for me, I really like the way the movie begins, and I want to put some focus and some attention on the creative opening credits. I I love a good opening credit scene. I think we can. Give, I think we should try to bring them back and and get some get creative with them. But you have the opening credits, and you have this. I think there is a version of this where it's really bad, but. They do this knockoff of like Monday Night Football from like the late '80s and early '90s, which was this country song. Are you ready for some football? Things like that. And in this case, they're they're doing a, like a Friday Night Football gimmick, which is pretty hilarious. But the song is actually good, and it really threw me off. It put me in the mood to watch the movie. Like I was super psyched for it, and the rest of the movie, in some ways, almost couldn't 
uh, it couldn't follow this fantastic opening. What do you think? Oh, man, the energy in that opening is so great. Uh, Friday night's a great night for football. Da, 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 da. So ever since I watched this two years ago, that song has been kind of like popping in my head like at least once a week. And me and my buddy, who's a big uh, Tony Scott fan, we're just texting each other random last Boy Scout reference and just like I just showed him a picture of Bill Medley and he just responds back, Friday night's a great night for football. So we're big fans of this song and I'm a big fan of Bill Medley. And if you don't know who Bill Medley is, uh, look him up because he's part of the Righteous Brothers and their legendary singing group from, you know, like the 50s and 60s. But Bill Medley is like a legend in terms of like movie soundtracks, folks. Like he did this song, obviously, but he did the song uh, for Dirty Dancing. Time of Your Life. He was also on the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Rambo 3 soundtrack. He was on the uh, Cobra soundtrack. Uh, and if you know that scene from Top Gun where they start singing that song, uh, that's the Righteous Brothers. And uh, also that's Bill Medley. So this dude is a legend. He was probably a legend before he even started putting his songs in movies. And then, of course, you got that legendary scene with the Righteous Brothers song with Go and Ghost. Uh, just a pure legend, man. And uh, around this time, he was just busting out bangers for movies. And not only that, he would go on to do a song, the love song, quote unquote, from Major League. So this guy is just like all over the place. And no matter what he did around this time, he was just like making bangers all over the place. This song's a banger. Check out, like I mentioned, the Dirty Dancing soundtrack. Go back and listen to the soundtrack for Top Gun. Like he's just such an amazing, soulful singer. And, uh, you know, my I remember, like, my parents taking me to Vegas in 1994 while they went and saw the Righteous Brothers, and I had no clue who they were until years later I realized, oh, wow, that, that's the group that my parents went and saw in 94 in Vegas. So uh, Bill Medley, man, what a legend. He's, like, 83 right now. Uh, you know, if he could just bust out maybe one more, I don't know if he can, but maybe the right kind of movie and the right kind of mood at his age, he can just bust out one of those old-school soulful medleys or something like that like i don't know but this song is like so addicting uh <laughs> like if you've never heard this song like you're gonna play it and want football on fridays like that when i hear this song i just want the nfl to change their schedule and give me at least one game on friday so they could play this song and license it out because it would be just a great hit so the concept of this movie is pretty great in that there's a lot of discussion about uh potentially legalizing uh, gambling. And I think in 1991, this is kind of an absurd idea. But here in 2024, gambling is so ubiquitous at this point that it's almost childish to think that it's not legal in, in so many ways. I know it's well, just still to be clear, it's sports gambling specifically, which is also right. Uh, a lot of it is connected to football, but yes, you are you are correct. You're, you, we are referring to just general sports betting and I mean, you can't turn on a sports broadcast for five minutes and not hear something about DraftKings or FanDuel or whatever uh, gambling of choice is going on. So it's it's so ubiquitous to the point of being annoying and it's making it's like to me, it's almost making gambling seem uncool. But I, I do like that dynamic. I think it's a really interesting plot line. It's probably one that I think almost deserved even more focus on it. But I think it's it's a really good idea, especially in 1991. This being a Tony Scott movie, I love the way Tony Scott movies, especially of this era, the late 80s, early 90s, like The Sun Through the Blinds, the perpetual golden hour look. Um, even the gunshots just have that very specific sound that I associate with the Tony Scott movie. That's what I love, man. And I think it's something that we miss so much these days, the way that movies... Like, we are so obsessed with naturalistic lighting that we miss out on things like what we see even in this movie with the, again, with the sunlight and the way that things are shot and the way things look. It's uh, it's pretty great. I really like it. And again, the fact that it's in Los Angeles uh, it makes a ton of sense. But yeah, Tony Scott is just in terms of the way that his movies look. I've always been a fan, even if the movies aren't great. There's always something interesting to look at. Just the, the way the shots are done and composed. I mean, it's something you, like you really feel like there is an actual director here. This isn't just being, you know, done to death by a studio. This is somebody who clearly knows what the hell he's doing. Yeah, no, I kind of forget that, like, I guess we should mention this, too, when we talk about Tony Scott, that the fact that he directed a bunch of commercials in the 70s and 80s. 
And uh, in the 70s and 80s, like commercials coming out of the UK were very like well directed, almost too well directed for the medium. If that makes if that makes any sense, to the point where like it kind of influenced commercials in the 90s for us. Um, like if you look at like early 90s commercials, there's this like aesthetic to them that kind of feels like almost like a Tony Scott kind of vibe. But that's kind of like the vibe that those commercials back then were kind of going for. Nowadays, it's more about stupid comedy and, and commercials is what I've noticed. And they've gone away from the cool stuff, except for maybe some car commercials. But you got to remember, that's kind of what I got to remind people about Tony Scott. He's a very much a visual director. He's less about the script, less about like metaphors and shit like that. He just wants to make shit look cool. The only one criticism I have of this movie is that I think he doesn't know how to shoot sports. Uh, I haven't seen Days of Thunder, so I don't know how he shot the racing scenes, but the the football scenes in this movie are like too dark to the point where it's like no one would have shown that on TV was too dark. Like there's no like sideline like lighting. There's no like giant lighting kits. It's all like dark and in the rain and somehow like it's somehow like perfectly lit for t- it makes no sense that that would be lit for TV is what I'm saying. So I don't know why he went that direction. I guess he wanted this to make it seem like dark and gritty like the world of football, but it didn't translate to the fact that that would be on TV. So that was my one criticism. And you can kind of see it towards the end of the movie as well when they go back to the Coliseum. But uh, it was cool to see the Coliseum filled up, but also weird that, like, at the end of the movie, the, everyone in the Coliseum, like, 90,000 people sees this dude, like, get obl- obliterated in a fucking helicopter blade, and then everyone just cheers afterward. Yeah, it's pretty... Uh, it's pretty. <laughs> that scene that you're describing is pretty bizarre, but... I mean, I guess this is kind of an exaggerated world where violence is more acceptable. I think we're just living in Shane Black's world at that point. I agree. I like the rain. Like, I like that idea. But I, I definitely agree with you that it's it's kind of ridiculous, just the look of it. Uh, it's not, not, not ideal, I would say. I do like the action scenes. I love the way they're shot. I mean, again, you're talking about somebody who's really good at shooting action. I love the way the shootouts are done, just how brutal the violence is. I mean, you feel the weight of the gunshots, and I think that's something that gets that can get lost really easily sometimes. But and I, you know, I would say the same thing about the way that Michael Mann in Heat, like it just the thundering sound design of the gunshots. That's something that really sticks with me, and. I think even in a movie that I don't think can make its make a decision about whether it wants to be like this buddy action comedy or like a super serious drama, the action scenes just are generally well done. Nothing too extraordinary. Like I don't think any one scene is great per se, but I think it's pretty consistent. I do like how like Shane Black uses the elements of LA in his action sequences, like uh, kind of a similar thing in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang where they go off the side of like a hill. There's a lot of hills in LA, folks. So, of course, you got cars going down the side of a hill and just making <laughs> this looks ridiculous. But then when you see it, it's like, wow, that was really fucking cool. <laughs> so, it is what it is. But at least it's like, you know, they're landing at someone's house on the side of a hill with a car, shit like that. It looks cool. Um, but yeah, the sound design in any, like, I would say Tony Scott and Michael Mann really. You know, because I mean, look, not a lot of people like Public Enemies, but I think Public Enemies has an excellent sound design in terms of like shooting, like the gun sounds like it's incredible. People don't give it credit for having an amazing sound design, I think, for Public Enemies. But in this case, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's that loud gunshot. And uh, I guess this is, where we, this is where we could talk about Holly Berry. Uh, she does a great job for 15 minutes, I think. Uh, and then she gets fridged, unfortunately. But she gets, like you mentioned, the brutal killing. She gets shot like six times with like a machine gun. Totally, like way more necessary than it should. Like she just, she probably should have got shot in the head once and that was it. But they just went so overboard with it. It's like, oh, that was like so over the top. But then it kind of draws you in. It's like, okay, that was like, okay, what's going on? Why did they just kill Allie Berry all of a sudden out of nowhere? And that kind of just kind of continues the plot. But it sucks because looking back, obviously, you wanted to keep her alive because she's so good. Right, and I think she's got chemistry with Damon Wayans, and she probably has like to, probably would pick up some chemistry with Bruce Willis being that third. But I think like they missed a big opportunity killing her off way too early. Halle Berry did a couple of these smaller roles in the early '90s, and it's it's disappointing that she wasn't a bigger star earlier. I mean, I think she is very good in this, and I think that, I mean, I would not. She's obviously not a character actor, but I think when the to me. 
you know, Bruce Willis is kind of an asshole. Damon Wayans, like, is just not working in this role. I think what makes this movie good, the elements that are good, I think is just the parade of tremendous character actors. And Halle Berry in this movie is one of them. But I want to highlight some of the others as well. Uh, Noble Willingham as Shelley Macron, the the owner of the Los Angeles team. Uh, he is really good. I don't know if you remember. To me, I will always associate him as being an Ace Ventura, another football adjacent movie, which we will 100% not be talking about. But he is uh, he is also uh, another one of those like old old school character actors that has been in a ton of things. I really like him. Uh, Bruce McGill as Mike Matthews, that incredible mustache. I mean, he's always had great facial hair. It is very good here. Uh, you got Kim Coates as one of the side henchmen. Uh, you got Taylor Negron as Milo, who I think is, he's also really good. Uh, my personal favorite, uh, speaking of Major League, uh, Chelsea Ross is Senator Calvin Baynard. Uh, he is, oh man, just when he, when he is sitting down and talking about sports gambling and giving the most middling answer ever and just talking about like how he's going to evaluate both things it's like he just nails that performance so uh just some really tremendous character actors across the board uh big fan of all of those people i also want to mention so i i never heard of joe santos before this and he again is somebody who's been in a lot of tv stuff but his performance as lieutenant ben Vaslo is incredible like Nobody told him that he needed to dial it down because he is at 99 for the entire movie, yelling at Bruce Willis, yelling about Bruce Willis. Uh, just the character actors in this movie are great. Oh, yeah. Like he was obsessed with catching him and he just he couldn't catch him because Bruce Willis didn't do anything wrong. Because that was the whole point of it all. He just couldn't accept the fact that Bruce Willis was a good person despite being this asshole. So I get it why he wanted to catch him so bad. He was he was great, though. Uh, Bruce McGill. I mean, what can you say? He's all over the place in terms of the 90s and 2000s and the 80s. But the one role that really sticks out with me, and this is probably going to ring a bell with you, Jerome, is that episode he did of Miami Vice, uh, where he played that cop that killed that criminal years before, and his psyche couldn't take it and kind of like was in denial that he even killed the guy until the fucking revealed to himself and Tubbs and Crockett that he buried the body in a fucking wall in some abandoned house. I don't know if you remember that episode, but he was tremendous in that. But here he's playing like I have a. I've not sc- watched a lot of Miami Vice. I'm, I'm on Moonlighting right now. I may, I may start well, watching. Here's Miami the tie-in. Vice. Bruce Willis was also a bad guy in an episode of I Miami Vice. Yeah, I, I am aware that Bruce Willis. Oh was. yeah, so there's a lot of Miami Vice connections in this as well. But if you've ever seen that episode, folks, with Bruce McGill, he is tremendous in that Miami Vice episode. That's one of those st- episodes that just sticks out in my mind because the performance is so haunting. But in this case, he's having fun. He's sleeping around with Bruce Willis's wife, and. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's just a scumbag, but then he just gets killed off too early again. It's like they killed off some of these good characters too early, which is unfortunate because, like, I think he would have, like, been so funny be, like, to have around towards the end. But then it kind of creates this conflict of, oh, oh, the dude slept with my wife. What am I doing being chummy with him still? So I get why they killed him off. But, like, man, he's such a good character actor. Um, yeah, and then, uh, of course, the, the owner, <laughs> Sheldon Shelley. <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess that's what I, I don't know who he's supposed to be based on, but he kind of reminds me of like, oh, what's his name? Uh, the old, I think he was the old owner of the Angels, but like he was a big famous cowboy like dealer, like he not car dealer. No, I, I forget his name, but he owned a bunch of car dealerships in L.A. And like, yeah, I think that's what they're trying to base it off of because he had the cowboy hat, too. And then I, what year did the Rams leave L.A.? The first uh, 1995. So they were kind of like they. I felt like the producer. So it, is, it is Gene Autry. That I was right. Gene, Gene Autry. Autry. Gene Autry. So I think it's based on Gene Autry, the look and everything. Um, it's sort of but it's awesome. just weird. It feels like they knew that they were leaving, doesn't it? Like it feels like they knew something was going on with the LA team, and then they just left four years later. I don't know. I mean, I think that was kind of a perpetual thing. I mean, the problem with Los Angeles is that they don't really care about their pro football teams. And I think that's still true to an extent, especially the Chargers. I don't know about the Rams, but it just feels like the Chargers are just kind of there. I don't know. You live there, so you could probably speak better to that. Well, the problem is, is that like their fan base is so angry that they left San Diego. So then they kind of take it out on us. But then the problem is like we get made fun of for like 
you know, whenever there's like a home game for the Rams or the Chargers, there's mostly away fans. You know what I mean? So I, they, I, well, it's it's easy to say when your fan base has never left. Like our like our team has left twice in LA, so it's hard to like rebuild that fan base over and over again. Like I get it. Like yeah, you're coming into our town. Like if you're the Niners and you've never left San Francisco, and there's more Niners fans in LA right now at the game. But that's just like you're lucky. You're kind of just saying that like I'm a spoiled fan that my fucking you know, that my team never left my town. You know what I mean? You can't say that for some of these teams that have been, like, heartbroken, like the Browns, who had to rebuild. So I, I just find it kind of, like, annoying. I don't know what I mean, just the Chicago Bears would go away. Well, that's a whole different story <laughs> for another podcast. But That is uh, that is another story for another, yeah. maybe, maybe a football-specific uh, podcast. But uh, so I think you and I are in agreement that uh, the, the, the daughter, in this case, uh, is is the best performance. Daniel Harris is Darian Hollenbeck. I mean, the initial scene with Bruce Willis that where they're just fighting is not great, but I think it it's better as the movie goes along and she becomes more of an active partner in this. And clearly, when you watch the nice guys, like you can see the connection between uh, between the, the character here and the daughter in the, the nice guys. But obviously, playing very similar roles, I you know, it just feels like. The, the movie is very clunky in terms of characters and kind of going in and out and, you know, killing certain characters off and then bringing some of them in and they can't really settle on a tone and the focus is kind of off. So we'll get to that in the negatives, but anything else to say about Daniel Harris? Um, you know, at first I thought the puppet shtick was stupid. Like, what are we doing here? And then it paid off. So I was wrong. So if you got a puppet and you're putting on Bruce Willis' hand, just assume that there's a gun underneath, because I was like, oh, there's a gun underneath, and this motherfucker's about to shoot. <laughs> and he, I was totally right. So that was cool. I'd never seen a puppet hide a gun before, so that was the first time I saw that. I don't we think I've seen that, that since. Back. We need huh? to bring it back. If I ever write a movie, Brian, I'm putting a scene in where somebody shoots a gun out of a puppet. I know. That's that's such a cool idea that I feel like no one's stolen from since. And it's, no, we're on the feel- same page about this. Absolutely. It was so cool. It was so cool. No, that was that was one of the best payoffs in the whole movie. Was, and Bruce Willis doing the puppet voice was actually awesome too. Yeah, maybe think like imagine if back in the day he did like a puppet movie or something. Or what if he did a voice in Team America? Is what I was thinking what too. If he did a puppet movie. Oh my god! Because <laughs> hard look, with Muppets and Bruce. Look, and- we all. I know you don't probably love Look Who's Talking as much as I do, but goddamn, Bruce Willis is so charming, and he's not even on screen in that movie. So. You- Realize that Bruce Willis played a talking baby that didn't actually talk in Moonlighting and in Look Who's Talking. Isn't that weird? He's got a good baby voice. What can I say? Like he's he's just got this like teal voice. I don't know. It's like you look at a baby and it's just like nowadays when I see a, a, a small baby and that's a male, I just think of Bruce Willis' voice, dude. Like I swear to God, because I've seen that movie so many times. It's just it's just something about his voice is just so like if he tones it down and he's not angry. It comes off like a soft, kind of innocent voice. Uh, for sure. Uh, so the negatives, I think we've already talked a little, little bit about Bruce Willis and Damon Wayans and not totally being sold on this. I don't know. I've never been like a huge Wayans person. I know, I think Marlon, you know, we've got Marlon and, and Scary Movie and, you know, they've they've done a lot of things. I haven't ever been super into their stuff. Obviously, um, them being African American creators, I think that makes it a little bit different. I was never super into In Living Color, but I'm also not super into sketch comedy in general. So yeah, I mean Damon Wayans just kind of misses me, and this was not the like the perfect role for him in my view. I think in some ways they're I don't know I don't know if Chris Rock would have been a better choice in 1991, but it just feels like they're they're going for somebody with kind of comedic chops and he's trying to be serious but it just doesn't work and i think that if you cast this movie now and you cast russell crowe and michael b jordan i think it's a a a much better movie i think you could then get the tone right um also the the wife character is an abomination poor chelsea field gets absolutely nothing to do i mean her role she just gets to play kind of i mean she just plays a bitch, like straight up is just a bitch. And it sucks because there is nothing to her character. She doesn't really get any agency of her own. I mean, it's bad. I mean, you could have just wrote her off and just have like, 
you know, a single father gimmick, and that would have been just as powerful or just as good, I, I think. Or you have her blow up in the car with her lover. Ooh, that would have been interesting, too, because then he's conflicted. But, uh, look, Damon Wayans, got- like... Yeah, Damon Wayans for me is always going to be Blank Man. Like, I love that movie as a kid, and we never got to talk about it on Superhero Panther because it, I don't really count it as that. It's more like, it's even less of a parody than Meteor Man to me. But, uh, you know, Major Pain, I always love a Major Pain. But uh, I didn't watch uh, Bamboozled until high school. And to me, that's the best I've ever seen him in Bamboozled. Like, that's. Yeah, I'm not even a big Bamboozled guy. I mean, this is, the, this is the thing about Damon Wayans. Like, his stuff. It just it it just completely messes me because I'm not a huge major pain guy, either. I don't know. Like, uh, I'm not. I don't want to equate these two individuals, but to me, I almost have the same feeling about Damon Wayans in lead roles as I do about Paulie Shore. It's just it doesn't. It never works for me. Wow. To be clear, I think wow. Damon, Wayans is, Damon Wayans is much more talented. Let's be clear. For sure, I get <laughs> you, man. I get you, and it's just. They, you know, he was, I don't know if he's like the older or the oldest, you know, Wayne's brother, but like they, he tried to be like the patriarch. It feels like before the Wayne's brother show, like I do love the Wayne's brother show, uh, with Sean and Marlon Wayne's love that show. So this yeah, is funny. I, I is probably my favorite of the Wayne's brothers. I, I do have to say that in terms of who I've enjoyed the most, it's probably him. Yeah, I think so too. Like me too on that one. Um, and not a lot of people watched that show back in the day, but I felt like it kind of picked up steam towards the end of its run. Uh, but uh, that's just kind of like me flash or, you know, being nostalgic for that show again. But yeah, man, I think Damon Wayans really tried hard and he, and he just doesn't quite fit the role, but that's not, you know, necessarily his fault, but it did make me want to watch Bulletproof and I've never watched that. So I'm really interested to watch that now because if you look at the, it's the casting, it's him and Adam Sandler. Therefore, Damon Wayans is the straight man. In that situation. So I'm kind of curious how he plays like the straight laced cop guy as opposed to like the sidekick comedy character. He's weird. He's like done movies with with Bruce Willis and Adam Sandler. It's just it's profoundly bizarre. Like he also I'm, I don't know if you remember this. He also did this movie Celtic Pride. Oh, I remember that one. That was a, a little too stupid for me, man. Just too ridiculous. Daniel Stern and Dan Aykroyd. What a random ass casting that is. We may need to actually watch that movie because I've never seen it. I am sure it's really bad, but we may actually need to. We may need to watch that in the fall uh, when that we get movie to, makes kidnapping look too like easy and convenient and just. I don't know. It feels it feels quintessential '90s <laughs> for sure. Uh, like I said, this feels like spare parts of other Shane Black movies. I think in terms of you've got, you know, the daughter character from the nice guys, uh, the racially mixed duo with uh, uh, with Lethal Weapon, uh, kind of a buddy cop vibe going on. So, yeah, it just it feels like these other elements. No Christmas, though, even though this did come out in December. I don't know. Maybe that's something that got wiped away from the script, but. A little bit of a, a little, some odd choices throughout, but uh, yeah, not my favorite. This definitely is like this is if this were if Tony Scott's filmography was uh, was a record, uh, this would definitely be on the B side of things. Is all I can say. I agree, but uh, if you're gonna go on the Tony Stark, I mean, excuse me, Tony Stark, Tony Scott, Tony binge, Stark. <laughs> excuse me, if you're gonna go on a binge of his, like this is something you don't want to skip either. I feel because I feel like. This is great visually, and it's great to see Daniel Harris just, like, shine, you know? And it's also see like it's good to see, like, Bruce Willis, like, kind of misfire, because, you know, sometimes it's you want to see a guy, like, always, you know, make hits, but sometimes it's good to see him, like, make a miss to kind of learn from that mistake. And I felt like he kind of learned a little bit from this, because after this, I think he went on to do, like, Death Becomes Her, and I think that's probably, like, my favorite again. I mentioned this before, like, my favorite Bruce Willis performance. So... Like he was getting there, you know what I mean. This this felt like he was just trying to like being paid to recreate Die Hard, and that's kind of where they're at. I would uh, I would agree with you wholeheartedly on that. So that is our discussion of the Boy Scouts. So as we mentioned, February is going to be kind of football month. Uh, we started a little bit early here. Uh, I guess technically this is coming out on February first, so we're we're not lying. Uh, but on Tuesday of next week. Uh, we're going to be doing something special, Brian. Uh, I'm going to say the movie, and you're going to say uh, the match, because the first Tuesday, we pair a movie with a wrestling match. And 
this was my choice when I conceived of this month. This is the movie that I wanted to review. I think this movie is super underrated. I am a huge Oliver Stone fan. It doesn't feel like people talk about Oliver Stone that much anymore. And it's kind of frustrating. And I would love to get into some of his other work at some point. But we are going to use this as a pretext to talk about any given Sunday. Also, one of my favorite Al Pacino movies of all time. And we'll get into the Willie Beeman of it all. Uh, we'll get into uh, some some dark stuff with this uh, with football. We'll talk about LL Cool J. We'll talk about Jamie Foxx. We'll talk about Cameron Diaz. Uh, but Brian, I know you're looking forward to any given Sunday. But what wrestling match are we pairing it off with? So there was a Raw Bowl, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, basically McMahon booked a four way tag on a Raw. I think it was like the first or uh, maybe the third Raw of the year. Or something like that, because it was in January, but it was a four-way tag match. Elimination rules. Yoko and uh, Owen, you got Smoking Guns, Sid and the Kid, and I believe the other team was Savio Vega and Razor Ramon. And as I recall, it's a fun match. It's just like, for a four-way tag match in 1996, it's kind of like unheard of. But then I went and did my research, and apparently the first four-way tag elimination match was on Mid-South Television in 1985. So that blew me away, but we'll talk about the history of like the four-way tag matches and, uh, and whether or not they should be elimination <laughs> rules or whatever, but it's it's a fun match. All I'm going to say is we will talk about homophobia next week, and I'm not going to tell you which part which one uncovers the homophobia. Oh boy, that could mean that could be Bruce Pritchard in a dress. That could mean a lot of things. Oh, no, there's something very specific. If you know the time period well, It'll it'll hit you in the face. I promise you that. Um, it could also be Oliver Stone. We are talking about football, and we're talking about 1999, so we could get homophobia in both. It's very possible. Definitely. And then I'll, I'll say this: Any Given Sunday was the first time I saw a football player scream in pain, and I was like, "Oh, so that's what they really feel? Like just total nonstop pain all the time." So we'll get into that. All right. So for Brian, my name is Jerome. Thank you so much for listening. We will talk to you again next week. The scene I'm referring to in particularly is when 